I'll just um, read a very uh, brief, um, dry biography of Ibrahim before leaving the stage to him. Um, so Ibrahim Mahama is an artist who lives and works in Tamale, in Ghana. Um, he's actually now here because he's on a residency for one year in Berlin as part of the Deade. Um, he earned a BFA and MFA in painting and sculpture, which he usually always underlines his background in sculpture, um, from Kwam and Kruma, University of Science and Technology. In 2012, he began producing Occupations, a series of itinerant installations made in collaboration with migrant communities using industrial materials, namely yuta fiber sacks uh, used to carry various commodities, and we will see a few of those. These sacks are introduced into spaces that question the systems of production and the sense of occupation. Architecture plays the role of both protagonist and antagonist in this immersive yet very temporal projects. His work has been included in a number of group shows, including Pangea 1 and Pangea 2 at the Saatchi Gallery in London, Silence Between the Lines in um, Ahenema Kokobeng in Kumasi, The Gown Must Go to Town in Accra, the 56th uh, Venice Biennale, All the World Futures, and in the uh, latest edition of Documenta, uh, Learning from Athens. Um, in which he's worked with both in Castle and in Athens. Um, in his most recent work, Exchange Exchanger, 1957-2057, um, he questions the place of modern architecture within two cosmopolitan cities in Ghana with subtle choices of form and time with his network of collaborators. Failure and crisis, mind that, are fundamental to his production processes. Thank you for being here, <laughs> Ibrahim. Thank you. I hope um, the, how many minutes do I have, essentially? <laughs> half an hour, okay, that's good. <laughs> um, I didn't prepare for half an hour, but I will, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll try to make it as short as possible. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. Um, I, as she said, um, um, Ibrahim, um, I had my entire background education in Ghana. Um, I went to the university uh, in Kumasi, which is the uh, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, where I studied uh, painting and sculpture throughout my bachelor's and master's, uh, master's and currently my PhD. Um, there was, um, I think for me, there was a deliberate reason to always go back to the idea of painting and sculpture, you know, um, throughout like <coughs> my time in uh, the university because uh, it was always very, you know, this discourse about what actually uh, uh, encompasses uh, a painting, and there's always this uh, uh, subject of the limitations of the, mat uh, the materials that composes a painting and the surface and the objects and all that, and in relation also to sculpture and the history of the materials. So I thought it was really important, particularly also uh, given the fact that um, most of these uh, paintings that we were referring to were also coming from a very uh, specific point within history, like looking at modern arts, for instance. And I thought that it was also very important to somehow fact, uh, uh, put into consideration the subjects, the subjects that were that that were or somehow always depicted within these paintings that are being produced. Because if you are making a painting, for instance, about um, a, a massacre and you're just uh, concentrating on the surface of it. I don't think you really do much justice to it than when you go back to the, <coughs> the material values of the work itself that you're producing. And secondly also, I think it's important also to uh, reflect on uh, the, residues of his the residues of history and also the residues of materials and uh, the, the forms in which they manifest in. So the reason why I choose this image as a beginning um, is because uh, it's the, the one of the, the, the bodies of the collaborators that I work with. And essentially it's uh, <coughs> these uh, collaborators that I work with that normally are young women who travel from the northern part of Ghana to, this, uh, to the urban spaces. Basically, you mostly find them in uh, Kumasi or Accra, which are the two biggest cities. And <coughs> what they do is that they are headquarters. They basically carry things from one place to the other. So from, 
if you buy something in the market, maybe uh, rice or anything, they carry it into your car or carry it to your house, and then you pay them something little, and they go back. And it ranges, like they're, they're, they, they could be as young as six years old to 18 to 20 to even 50 years old. But most of them essentially are very young, like between the ages of six to um, 18 and 20. And it's a p fundamental problem that has never really been addressed within our own history. And it's also because it's been a problem that has emerged also out of the colonial legacies that we've had. Originally, um, yeah, so originally, um, yeah, the, uh, originally when, uh, when the railway network was built in the 19th century by the British, they built it mostly within uh, the coastal parts of Ghana and also within the southern parts, basically places where there were a lot of minerals to re uh, extract because when you go much towards the northern part of Ghana, it's much drier, so there isn't much to, um, um, mostly they, it's, they are more dependent on f uh, cultivation of food over there, but the colonialists were much more interested in raw materials like uh, gold, uh, bauxite, diamond, and others. And this image actually is an archival image dating back to the uh, early uh, <coughs> 20th century of uh, um, gold, either gold or bauxite that is being transported at the port of uh, the western ports within Ghana to be sent to uh, England. And during the 1950s when Ghana gained independence, the plan was actually by the fir our first president because, because he was kind of a socialist. So he thought it was really important to use the history of the railway network to like because it, it had a much more negative impact in t historically uh, in terms of what the infrastructure was meant for. But he thought we could somehow subvert this. So, so there were plans to expand these uh, railway networks uh, into the north so they could somehow unify the country. Um, also because the south had more resources. Obviously there was a lot of bias in terms of like how people within the south through the colonial period had uh, certain ideas about people who are coming from the north because even within the state itself people the tendency was that people living within the south because there wasn't much contact because of the lack of infrastructure road networks and other things they they mostly would think that maybe the people from the north are savages or something because there's this historical way of the um, there is there are some words that people are somehow forbidden to use because in the past like for instance I come from the north and like when someone in the south refers to someone from the north, normally they use a word. Um, and when that word, when you translate it, it means the bushman. And still people use it, you know, because the <coughs> this, uh, this condition still somehow very much exists within there. And for me, as an artist, I always ask questions about, as an artist, how do I somehow translate these things? Or how do I even, because it's also an ideological thing and I'm, um, Asking myself, then again, coming back to the idea of museums, institutions, if we were thinking about, let's say, engaging uh, a public about a history and also about aesthetics and all these things, how do we create these forms? So that's, why, that's when the occupation series actually emerged because I became very much interested in some of these uh, architectures that were built also within the 1950s. This is uh, one of the silos that was constructed in the uh, late 1950s. Uh, meant to store uh, grains, basically cocoa, because you know cocoa is one of the is the it's actually the 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 biggest exchange commodity for Ghana and uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, but when these structures were built, when they started building them towards the the mid 60s, that was when the coup happened with uh, Nkrumah. So a lot of these structures were never continued. They bas they basically stopped building them. So this image that I took of it actually is um, an image that I took uh, almost two years ago. So it's almost like you go back into time. When you look through those very tiny holes where the grains are supposed to come from, you, um, you still see the cranes that were used in lifting the concrete and all the beams and other things. And sometimes they create these really interesting abstract forms. Of course, in as much as, as an artist, I'm always drawn first by the form, and secondly, it's informed by the history because they, the aesthetics somehow contains the politics within it because there are a series of choices that led up to these specific uh, forms and aesthetics that exist. So when I became interested in the jute sacks because of the histories they possess and what they do physically because they used to carry cocoa and later on used to carry 
charcoal and other things. And because of the stain and the character that it takes, it, be it becomes really interesting. But we never really think of it in relation to the sites they once came from or the sites that they are related to in terms of their history, like their global history. So I started, because also to face the fact there was nothing, like I, um, I didn't have any studio. Um, there are no museums to show any of the works that you're going to do. So, and also the, you're dealing with an audience that somehow do not really understand the language that you are proposing, or they are very much used to a very specific language of painting. So for instance, if I describe myself as a painter to anyone, they would be expecting to see me painting on a canvas, which I did for many years when I was in art school. Um, but I thought there were other ways to expand upon this uh, language of phenomenon, particularly taking the conditions in which uh, the conditions I inherited as a starting point, whether be it the decay or failure or anything. So I started proposing going to these specific sites and working with these collaborators who have migrated from these um, from the north to the south and traveling with them and producing these works through different spaces. So the railway became a very important site in terms of even how the, <coughs> the aesthetics also contributes to the, the form of the work. Um, the silos, which were significantly built around the country, there are things that you see, unlike maybe the monuments of Father the Deccan. These things are really huge monuments. They are there, but for over 60 years, we've always looked at them, but we've never really asked ourselves, what are these things and what did they even mean uh, formally or what were the ideological implications of these things because when you think about economic independence and all those uh, pan-Africanist ideas most of these uh, buildings actually like were built actually within those periods and within those spirits but we never really had any real um, convictions and discussions about them after the 60s so I thought it was also important to begin to propose new ways of looking at spaces within the city and expand upon the language so <coughs> this um, is part of the occupation series and um, um, this it was more an accidental image because in doing research most of the projects you have to negotiate a lot with city authorities and with this building in particular it's built within the university where I study in. And um, when I was doing the original image of it, when I was photographing the building in terms of uh, looking at the architecture and all that, uh, later on, when the, the sax came onto it, I thought there was something really interesting about it in terms of looking at the, the, the architecture uh, <coughs> almost within a single frame, like one which is covered and one which is not. And coming back to this idea of what it actually means to occupy a space because the building is actually in use when these um, engagements happen. So it's very important in terms of how the people who occupy these spaces also relate to it and contribute to the forms. Um, the National Theatre of Ghana, it was also part of the Exchange Exchanger that I worked on. And um, it's actually a building that is used for uh, theatre performances and other things. And I, yeah, we thought it was important. Actually, <coughs> I thought we had made some kind of progress because with this same work, 20 years ago, it wouldn't have happened. But a lot has happened to afford us this moment to be able to do these things. So I thought it was really important also to propose to the younger generation of artists and people who are thinking about even uh, uh, proposing new ways of looking at uh, spaces within the city to always at least propose, it, no matter how radical it was in terms of like in, uh, making interventions within spaces. And um, we somehow uh, succeeded in convincing the authorities in uh, how we could reuse some of these spaces. And also um, occupying, all this is also still part of the exchange exchanger, also occupying spaces that were built for affordable housing, but due to political reasons were never completed. And so it's not always about occupying the entire space. This, in this image, you realize that the building, the framework or the skeleton, it's more central. And I think it was important to also highlight the fact that um, <coughs> it isn't so much as an artist, I'm interested, of course, in uh, um, the, what I make or what I create, but I he also heavily depend on, upon what already exists and how we reflect upon those things through subtle interventions or just changing something very little within the, within the space. 
it's a much, it's a very big project. I can't really go deep into all of it, but it's just supposed to be an introduction. Um, this is an important image for me because it goes back to my participation in Documenta, and this is from Kassel. So the image on the left-hand side is an archival image of the Henschel Hallen, which Henschel was the one of the first and biggest uh, train manufacturers in Germany. They produced a lot of trains that were used within the colonial states. Um, I proposed to, pro to use that factory, which was used in pro uh, producing most of these trains in Kassel, as a point of uh, reflection. So we actually took a lot of the cocoa bags which had been transported globally and around the world, which were almost decayed into this space where the audiences of Documenta could uh, participate in the production of this work. So there is this kind of uh, reflection or relationship between uh, looking at the image uh, containing the trains that were being manufactured as against um, just looking at these uh, materials which are decaying as a result of the, um, the current global transactions and capitalist uh, modes of production. Um, so this is uh, in Athens, um, a building that was built in the 1920s when actually a lot of Greeks had to migrate to Athens because of the Ottoman invasion. And uh, I think it was also important in terms of using that as a point of reflection. Because as a Ghanaian, I'm, I, always real, I always thought that I was very much interested in like, uh, not, it's not a Ghanaian problem, it's, I think it's a global problem, but I was always very much interested in how I could use my local conditions as a starting point to produce the artwork. But it's a very much uh, global problem. And when I travel around the world in terms of doing projects, I realize that these things manifest in very different forms. And sometimes they don't really manifest within the same aesthetics that I'm, I'm quite used to. So it's also very interesting in terms of how it influences uh, my decisions in terms of the forms that the images take. And this building is currently being occupied by mostly anarchists and also uh, political refugees who are fleeing from uh, Turkey or uh, Syria or other places. And um, yeah, they were, of course, it's, it's, a, it's an entire discussion in itself because it was a very, very, uh, <coughs> it was a very intense project and um, which actually led me into um, thinking about using the Parliament Square, which is Syntagma, which normally when there are a lot of, um, when there are protests, for instance, within the, uh, the, the, the Greek crisis a few years ago, which you, each time a drone image was taken of it, you realize that it, the square was occupied by thousands and thousands of people. But I propose that why don't we just occupy the square with these few bags, which have somehow traveled extensively around the world, <coughs> and they're very much connected to the body. So when the, when the bag occupies the square, it almost occupy, it's, it's almost like, it's very heavy in, within its aesthetics and also within its sense. And also because we are not really dealing uh, directly with the parliament, but we are dealing with a space that somehow reflects upon the conditions in which the, the policies that are make, may, uh, created within this space uh, leads to. Um, the dual image, the, 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 so f these, these two images come from the very last day of um, Documenta, um, uh, the opening of Documenta in Athens, which was actually the last day of my work in Athens as an artist, because I proposed doing this work before Documenta opened. So before Documenta opened, I was doing these series of performances of working within factories and other spaces, using them as sites of productions, which uh, immigrants and other people work. But by the time the exhibition itself opened, the work, the residues of the work was more going to be about what happened before the exhibition itself. Um, there was a, te uh, a Kurdish uh, protest that day. So right after the, um, the performance was over, the police uh, created this barrier that separated the parliament from the square. So that's why you see the police uh, within that space. So I also still question myself, going back to this image, about what it actually means in terms of uh, relating and dealing with the states. Um, so this is a, a drone f image that I took, which actually uh, uses the street as this kind of point of division between the parliament and then the square. And also, um, you realize that the, the occupation within the square is almost like this stain. It's almost like a stain within the image. And I thought it was really important in terms of reflecting upon that. 
like using the stain as a, a, a starting point of a certain kind of uh, deliberation, both aesthetically and also looking at it in a pure in a purely political sense. Um, so these are other projects that I've done. Uh, also going back to the, the history of the, the railway network and using residues within the trains as a starting point of production and reflecting upon other objects starting from the, the engines of the trains or these boxes that I used in making these installations in Brazil, in London, recently at the Venice Biennale um, last year and also uh, currently with an exhibition I'm doing in a Palazzo Gallery in Brescia. Um, and sometimes the materials also change. So it's not always coming from the same specific material points that I'm used to, but I also like this way that the material can change. And also the, it's, in, it's in dialogue with a lot of different spaces. So sometimes it's in a dialogue with a very, very wide cube space. And sometimes it's also in dialogue with um, the, the, some of these spaces, these original spaces. So I thought that it was, as an artist, it's very important uh, in the production, um, to factor the production of the artwork as essentially uh, part of the political co the, the political component of the work it's the work itself, and I think that's what led me particularly to Antwerp with relation to this image of uh, Father Deccan, because um, yeah, of course, so, uh, people sometimes would wonder uh, why would uh, an artist working with abstract forms or installations be working with a very traditional. A visual form but I think it's very important in terms of what all these images uh, present and how we reflect upon them how do we intervene upon them uh, how do we see the role of the museum how do we see the role of um, just uh, citizens and how to reflect upon their own history and the collective history that we share as um, uh, as human beings and um, I think the most important decision that we made in the the two most important decisions was one to make the to make the reproduction of the sculpture in rubber and not in uh, bronze because bronze there's something very eternal about, about bronze and rubber imagine if the original statue of Father Deccan was made in rubber and placed in a uh, in public square or made in chocolate and it would dissolve or something it wouldn't be possible ideologically so I think it's and also materially so it's not it's also very important to reflect upon the material conditions of the sculpture itself in relation to the histories that the sculpture itself possesses in a way um, yeah, so, and also about uh, the choice of the clay and then also about the, the, the birth certificate, which is coming from uh, an original piece which I did uh, a year ago called Ofadama, which uh, actually deals with the birth certificate of the collaborators and people who occupy spaces within marginalized cities and like maps of like mining uh, towns. And yeah, so I think we are interested in this kind of multi-layered history and how both as artists and curators and as cultural historians and philosophers and like even just uh, ordinary citizens, how do we engage with all these things? Um, it's not always that we can have like uh, debates about these things, but sometimes it's just um, also about uh, proposing forms which people can some, uh, yeah, take time to reflect upon. Um, it's quite cold, so I'll leave it here, <laughs> and hopefully, uh, yeah, we we discuss it more in the future. Thank you. was more interesting for you in relation to uh, the history of the sculpture because I'm assuming you had to also learn about that particular history of the sculpture since uh, you're an artist yeah. from Ghana yeah uh, what was the, the thing that kind of uh, pushed you to, s to start thinking about the work well, I think it was uh, first from the form yeah just looking at the sculpture within its uh, physical sense and secondly also because you know uh, in dealing with uh, sculptures like this, not just this very problematic sculpture, but also sculptures, sculptures in general, in terms of how these monuments are normally uh, uh, displayed with the plinth and everything. So it was one of the things that came up a lot in terms of how we could 
represent this image in a new form. So it's the, because it's very important in terms of the decisions you make, whether you, uh, you maintain the sculpture within its uh, height, because it's a very colossal uh, statue. So do we reduce it or do we present it within the eye level, uh, uh, the human uh, scale? or we shrink it because it, it could have also been very possible to like make very tiny pieces of it and spread it all around the place. Um, yeah, so these, this was one of the things that led, uh, I was very much interested in and also about just the fact that it was um, in the material that it was in. And I thought we could use the material as a starting point to, uh, into the sculpture. So honestly, the rubber, using the rubber as a starting point was what was much more interesting to me before anything came up. She's pointing out how matter and scale are two core aspects of his work.